Hello and welcome to Sitcom Showdown, episode 85. My name is Jeffers and I'm here with my bro, Steve. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's good to be back in the podcast studio. and um, It's fantastic. It's even better to be following up on the, the previous podcast where for the actor special. I love the actor specials. Anyway, um, it was your turn last time. Who did you choose, Steve? Jeffrey Palmer. The great Jeffrey Palmer. And so it's my turn this time around. Yep. And, and, uh, yes. yes. Who have you got? I've chosen... Ted McGinley. Oh, yeah. Because just you sent me the episode we're going to be talking about later, and I watched it, but it could have been any one of the cast three members. or four people. So yeah, yes. you've been thinking, waiting with bated breath. Is he going to choose Ed O'Neill? You were thinking. Is well, he going to choose Amanda Bierce? Is he going to choose? But then it is the first Peggy. appearance of of Jefferson. Jefferson Darcy. So yes, makes sense. Oh, now um. <laughs> I will explain for the listener who doesn't know who Ted McKinley is uh, in the first few minutes all about Ted. Um, yes, uh, well, he was born on May 30th, 1958, which in the current year makes him 63 years old right now. Uh, he's still only a young man. Um, yeah, I've picked Ted not only because he's played one of my favourite sitcom characters, but his career, when you stop to look at it, mm. which I'd never done before, is quite remarkable, Steve. Um, he's got at least 380 sitcom episodes under his belt what in some of the most successful sitcoms of all time uh where do you know ted mcginley from well really just from married with children but i've got a feeling he's done because he's such a handsome bloke yeah he is has he done some work in soaps that i might have seen him in yeah Mm -hmm. certainly Yep, all right. Well, I'm yeah. looking forward well, to hearing more about it. I'll this. give you the rundown then. So we, we do know him best as Jefferson Darcy on the sitcom Married with Children. Um, that was all through the 1990s, but we'll hear about that. Um, he played a bloke called Charlie Chanowski on the cool. ABC sitcom Hope and Faith. Now, this is from 2003 to 2006. Huh? And I think it was three seasons, maybe two, of that sitcom. Um, Ted McGinley was also a late-era cast member on Happy Days. Oh, and The was Love he, uh, Boat. Yeah. Yeah. And Dynasty, all in the oh, 1980s. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Totally see those. But Happy Days, was he, what, a friend of Richie's or something like that? He was, and we'll we hear know? about this soon. He, um, uh, Richie departed when Ron Howard left. Yeah. They brought in their nephew, you know, Mr. and Mrs. C, the Cunningham's nephew, yeah, 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 Roger. Yeah. And he um, moved in with them, starting to teach at the local high school. Mm. So a young man just out of college. And he's, I think he was the phys ed teacher at the local high school. Anyhow. Um, Hang on, Ted, are you saying Ted Ted played that character? Yeah. Oh, serious? He played young Roger. Yes. Huh. Roger, uh, we'll find out. Uh, you might also know him, Steve, uh, Ted McGinley, for playing the villainous role of Stan Gable in the classic film Revenge of the Nerds, <laughs> where he was the super evil, nasty jock dude leader of all the jocks who were always trying right. to, well. out to get the nerds. It's been a hot minute since I've watched that movie. <laughs> it's been a hot 35 years since yeah. you watched that movie. Now, currently, Ted McGinley's on a couple of family drama shows. Now, one of them's called The Baxters, which is three years in, I think, and he's one of the two leads, who's Mr. Baxter. Um, the other one's in post-production, and it's called Keeping Up With The Joneses, and I think that's you know got a bit of a dark edge to it. Mm. But, oh, I didn't look very closely into it. Hmm. <laughs> Um, yeah, so let's let's go back even further, though, Steve. I reckon right. we can look at his background. We've gone back, we've come forward, and now we're going back again. That's right. He was an active California kid, you know. So he um, grew up in Newport near Newport Beach, yep. and so he's always on the beach. And during the summers, he was a lifeguard and all this sort of stuff. Um, so at high school, he did sporty stuff and became a bit of a water polo standout. Hmm. Eventually, uh, he had a bit of a tough start in water polo because he was a bit slow and a bit short and a bit, you know. But as he got older and grew taller and got Mm -hmm. faster and worked harder. Anyhow, um, then into college, uh, which was also in California, he sort of continued the water polo thing and became really kick-ass. And uh, he was studying urban planning and real estate. What a guy. Yeah, what a guy. Um, And that'll become important (laughs) later on, steve So anyway, his girlfriend sort of convinced him to go and do some modelling. And there was this GQ magazine appearance that that led to. And then there was a move to New York to try his luck and try Mm. and sort of capitalize on this. He um, 
was picked up by TV producer Gary Marshall from Happy Days because he, oh, yeah. he needed, you know, some sort of bronze, tanned, athletic dude to come in and play this part. And uh, he, he got Ted on board. And, yeah, anyway. Hang on, so you're saying that was his first role? That was his first TV role, yes. And that must have been one of the major characters on the show. Yes, and, and you know that because in the beginning of the show when the theme tune's rocking and they put up the photos and the name of the actor, mm. he's one of those, you know, six or seven people with a photo and the name what? of the actor. So, yeah, How did man. he jump straight into that? Well, we're going to find out because I've got some great clips for you. I've got some great clips for the listener. And uh, so uh, I think we should have a clip where Ted tells it himself. And I've taken this one from an interview show called The Five Count. Now, the five count are out of Minnesota. Uh, back in 2014, they got Ted on board to plug whatever his latest project was at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and these these dudes, Dustin and Justin, uh, they actually do some great interviews. So I think we should hear from Ted. Can you explain, you know, I guess your knack for being casted on so many of these iconic shows? Is it just uh, is it luck or what is it? Yeah, I would say it's uh, I would say it's luck. I mean, you know, it's so funny when I started on Happy Days. Uh, I had zero, I'd never even seen a script. I was just sort of on it. Uh, I got Gary Marshall's a guy who will type, he'll cast people by a type. And he needed an all-American kind of uh, sort of ex-jock athletic guy to be on the show. And I was lucky enough to be that guy. And it was sort of like going to film school because I learned everything by just being on that set. And then I went into the, what happens is I go in and do guest spots on show, shows, and then pretty soon, like when I did Love Boat, they said, hey, that was great. How'd you like to be on a full-time? <laughs> Same thing with Married with Children. I did a guest spot, and they were like, wow, how about you do this all the time? So uh, that's really how I, how I got jobs. Yes, yes. And so uh, just before we get back to it, Steve, mm. one more. This one's from a, a really long interview. I think it went for about an hour or something. Uh, interviewer called Lisa Heisha or Heisha uh, found it on YouTube from 2015, but he sort of goes into a little bit more detail here. Mm-hmm. You had potential and you had a look. I had a look, and and Gary Marshall, who is, I mean, the genius of Gary Marshall is he takes people, he can see what your most honest spot is. You, someone like Julie Roberts from Pretty Woman, and and he develops and brings out this part of you that he sees and and he can sort of cast a type and and i got lucky enough that he he did that with me and gave me the was patient enough to allow me to sort of they all were to allow me sort of to develop and so i was on the show with you know some of the greatest absolutely actors around and i would i was so intimidated in fact when i was in high school i would run home from workouts so we could see the show on television. Now, one day I literally blinked my eyes and I was on the air with them. Frightening. And so I learned because I was, I wasn't, I just am that kind of person. I just won't quit until I can look at myself. So, yeah, it's pretty much as you described. Dude goes to New York. Yep. Probably a few weeks later, he's on Happy Days. Going, locked, locked into it. Holy moly. Have I bitten off more than I can chew here? Yeah, so he did 61 episodes of Happy Days. He started in 1980 on this episode called Hello, Roger. And so he finished up in 1984 when the show finished. So uh, he was there for a fair old time. I mean, Mm. 61 episodes of Happy Days. He joined the show quite a while after the literal Fonzie Jumps the Shark episode. (laughs) Um, So a couple of seasons after that or whatever, Richie Cunningham leaves, Ted McGinley comes in. Um, So anyway, yes, he was uh, Roger Phillips, the nephew of Mr. and Mrs. Cunningham. Now, as I said, Steve, he's a young teacher. Uh, He's what you and I would describe as a a crispy dude. He's a a very upstanding citizen. He's sort of a real Captain America type Boy Scout. Well, Richie was pretty much that kind of a person. Richie's a crispy dude. Yeah, totally. <laughs> He's totally crispy. Yeah, man. Um, and so that this is why they got him in to be a sort of Richie issue, in that it's a contrast to the Fonz. Mm. They're kind of opposites. And anyway, I want to play you a clip from Happy Days in which you literally get to hear the two approaches in trying to get through to... In this scene, It's there's this hoodlum kid who stole Roger's wallet and he's he's acting up because uh, the theory is that he wants to get kicked out of school. Yeah. Mm. Caught me red-handed. You'll just have to uh, throw me out of school. Sit down. 
Fonzie, if you don't mind, I'll handle this. Hey, I'm on your turf, sure. Yeah, yeah thank you. I'll just sit over here. Okay. Out of the way. <laughs> now, I've looked at your files, and you don't seem to be the idiot you pretend to be. I'll try harder. <laughs> Look, Roach, one of the goals I'm trying to implement here is the OCAEP, or what I like to call the Off-Campus Academic Employment Program. Now, I've discussed it with some of the local businessmen, and they'd be willing to employ or intern, if you will, some of our students as they work towards their high school diploma. Oh, Roger. <laughs> yeah. I think you're missing the point. Hmm? I think this young man wants you to throw him right out of school. Well, why would someone want to forfeit their right to a quality education? <laughs> I don't know, but let's find out. <laughs> You go to school in the morning, you work in the afternoon, you make some real money, buy gasoline. Yeah? Yeah. I like that. <laughs> Tell them thanks. <laughs> so, yeah, we miss a bit on the visuals because, you know, when Roger is going through his very long-winded and formal and technical explanation mm. of the program he's offering to this young chappy, like the camera's on Fonzie and he's just rolling his eyes and shaking his head and thinking, dude, you have no idea. And so Fonzie just lays it out for him and says, listen, kid, work in the afternoon, school in the morning, buy some gasoline for your car. Yep. So, so he's, yeah. he's over school. He just wants to get a bit of independence and yeah, yeah, yeah. do all that stuff. Um, yeah, there's there's more to it. But anyway, that that just, it was a scene I could quickly find that shows you their two approaches. Yep. Yes, yeah, so as I watched these sort of Roger era late happy days, you can see all the Ted McGinley strengths already, which is mostly in facial expressions and reaction shots and stuff mm. like that, and generally being a good support. And, you know, he, it's difficult for him because he's playing the straight man to Fonz, so he has to set up a lot of this stuff, which is harder than you'd think. And so the, the problem for Ted McGinley there as Roger is he has to be kind of unexciting and a bit dull. Yep. But he still has to be magnetic and not boring to watch, which is, I suppose, why they wanted a handsome dude. Um, but he wasn't going to get all the good lines. No. He wasn't going to get any of the good lines. It was going to be the Fonz getting all the good lines. But anyway, as Ted said, it's like an, this incredible training ground. Um, and Marion Ross, Mrs. C, mm. sort of took Ted McGinley under her wing because she'd been doing it forever and she really sort of helped him out and turned him into an actor, and so did Henry Winkler as well. So they helped him develop. Anyway, after Happy Days in 1984, um, Ted went straight into the movie work, right? He did Revenge of the Nerds, and that mm -hmm. came out pretty quickly afterwards. And he played that total arrogant scumbag jock in it, and yep. a great villain, and a total opposite to what he'd just been playing in Happy Days. And then in the same year, he got pulled straight into the love boat as the ship photographer Ace. <laughs> Now, look, Steve, I know, you know, the love boat, strictly speaking, it's a one hour mm. format and there's a bit of romance in it and yep. a hint of drama, but it's mainly comedy. So I'm counting it oh. as a sitcom right. <laughs> for the purposes of this retrospective. But he did three years of the love boat, which was 60 episodes again, and yep. he finished up in 87. Was that, where was that in the, the run of the love boat? Oh, the love boat had been going since probably, I'm going to say 75, 76, 77. Oh. So this is a... This is that way... must have gone forever. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happens is... So um, he's come in at the end again. Yeah. You, you're <laughs> putting your finger on this theme beautifully, and, uh, Steve. You're in the zone. He does it again in Married with the Children. He does. Ah, oh, dude. Um, this is almost spoilerific, what you're doing here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, no, back. it's cool. It's cool. So at the t same time as he's doing Love Boat, right? He's yeah. also mm -hmm. on Dynasty in 1986, 1987, right. and he did 34 episodes of Dynasty as well. Now, I haven't watched any of those episodes. I don't know whether he was a very peripheral character, but mm. I suppose if you're doing 34 episodes, you're you not that bloody peripheral. Yeah, you couldn't be. No. Um, anyway, all that finishes up in 87, right? So in 1987, Ted's had seven years of solid TV comedy work, over 120 sitcom episodes. He's done a big movie with a major bad guy role in Revenge of the Nerds. And that's like <laughs> a bit of a change from his good guy TV roles. Mm. Um also in the mix, as we said, he's done 30-odd episodes of cheesy drama with Dynasty. 
So I think, because uh, earlier you mentioned soaps and stuff, it mm. doesn't get more soapy than Dynasty. No. Blimey. So Ted's profile at this point in 1987 would have just been enormous and he's, you know, 29 years old or something like that. Yeah. So it's amazing. Most sitcom actors wouldn't be lucky enough to even have that sort of career. And he hasn't even hit 30 So he's yet. just coming into the peak of his powers yeah. and what's he going to... What's he going to do next? Well, I think <laughs> How's now... he going to spend the best years of his life? <laughs> well, that's right. He's living next door to Al and Peg. <laughs> <laughs> what more could you ask for? Uh, yes, anyway, so let's get into the good stuff, Steve. We're going to skip ahead to 1991 and the fifth season of Married with Children. So most shows are kind of sputtering out by the fifth season, right? But I think for Married with Children, this is this is where it's starting to take off. It was just about to peak. And so uh, to give you a bit of context, Marcy, who's the next door neighbor of Al and Peggy, she'd originally been married to Steve. Yep. And a couple of seasons before he left. And so we've just come off this season, season four, where there was a lot of mileage to be made out of single Marcy. Mm. But it's a bit of an unfair fight, right? So I guess they said, we've got to give her another husband. Yep. So it's an equal, you know what I mean? Yeah, but, they're on an equal footing yes. with the Bundys. But the genius of it is they've given her this guy that uh, isn't always an ally, but we'll, we'll find this out. Um, Married with Children kept steamrolling along after Ted McGinley joined. He did seven seasons in six years for Married with Children, uh, 167 episodes. Crazy. They really pushed out some episodes. Totally. Um, and that finished up in 1997. So that's Ted in business for most of the 1990s, seven years of work. Mm. Anyway, Steve, that brings us to the episode for this podcast. Our feature episode. Yes. So let's go into the clip. Mm. <laughs> Hi, Al. Did you, did you know there's a little rain cloud that only hangs over your house? <laughs> yeah, it showed up after the kids were born. <laughs> what can I do for you? Well, listen, Al, if, uh, if Marcy should come by asking for me, w- would you tell her I went out to buy her a gift, okay? You're running, huh? <laughs> it's never quite the same when you're sober, is it? <laughs> no, that's not it, Al. You see, I, I, I just haven't found a way yet to tell Marcy that well, I have to see my parole officer. You mean like if there's only a bucket of beaks at the wedding, you'll go crazy and start slashing kind of parole officer? <laughs> no, I don't want you to get the wrong idea, Al. I'm not a bad guy, okay? I, I just, uh, you know, I, I stole a bunch of money from people who trusted me. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> You're not going to tell anybody, are you, Al? It's, it's not something I'm real proud of. Jeff, I'll tell you something. Telling Al Bundy is just like telling the wind. Well, thanks, Al. I appreciate it. That's all right. See you. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. I know a secret. I was just so happy. Oh, yeah. Holiday. Oh, my goodness. Okay, context for the episode before I launch into the actually quite compact synopsis for a change. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, Now, this is Married with Children season uh, five, episode number 12, so pretty much halfway through the season. It's titled Married With... We've covered two episodes already. Who, yeah. Of Married With Children. This will be the third episode. I'm crowbarring them in all over the shop. Yep. Um, 1991. Now, as you've just said, we've already done Married With Children twice on Sitcom Showdown, most recently with Podcast 74, and that's when Al was hanging out with the aliens. Yay! (laughs) Did I... I think I chose that one, didn't I? No, I think I chose it knowing that you'd let it go into no. the Hall of Fame because it's one not, of your favourites. Not that I'd let it go, that I'd push <laughs> it into the Hall of yeah. Fame. Oh, good, good, good. Um, anyway, for those of you who don't know, um, Married with Children started in the late 80s on this brand new network called Fox, who took mm. a gamble on this family who were the total opposite of shows like Family Ties and, and the then hugely popular Cosby show. Uh, uh, the Bundys were poor and mean and generally uh, really trashy. Um, So we open the episode in the Bundy living room with the young Bundys, Kelly and her brother Bud. Uh, They're both on the couch shouting at Al about how they want to throw a party. One on each side. Yeah. Yeah, Shouting in an ear each. Yeah. Uh, They both want to throw a party for different reasons. Anyway, Bud wants one for his soccer bros and Kelly wants to have a party to host all her modelling babe friends. And Al's just between them copying all of this. But he's staring off ahead into space and all this sort of venom is rolling off him, Steve. Um, and so the kids give up because they know Al's zoned out and they tell their mum, Peggy, that, you know, Al has indeed zoned out. So she tells the kids 
don't worry, Al's just in his little fantasy land where he's visiting his retirement property. Um, so this sort of daydreaming is probably the only thing that keeps mm. Al sane. Absolutely. You know, it's away from the reality of his crappy job and the family he doesn't like. So after some banter with Peggy and Al, Marcy bursts into the Bundy house in her dressing gown. Um, she reluctantly confides that she's just woken up after a hardcore banker parties, Dave. Yeah, for a while they're the worst. Yeah, no one parties like a banker. Uh, this is the previous night, and there's some strange dude in her bed, and Marcy doesn't even know what he looks like. And worse, it turns out she's married this guy because she's mm. found this ring on her finger, and she's wearing a T-shirt that yeah, said, shirt. Oh, <laughs> I got married at Clyde's wedding. No blood test needed wedding chapel, and all I got was this lousy T-shirt. Right. Mm-hmm. Don't the ask impl- me why they need blood tests. Well, the, to prove that you're not family, I guess. Just oh, blimey. Kind of, well, wouldn't you think? This is the kind of thing that... That's the kind of joke that Al would make about Peg's family. Oh, from Wanker Am County. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that family are notorious. Is that it. where they hold the banker? Yeah. The bank party? Yeah. No. No, <laughs> they didn't hold the, the banker party in Wanker <laughs> County. Anyway, <laughs> getting back on track. Kelly and Peg think... <laughs> They just think it's great. She's just woken up with some dude. She doesn't even know what he looks like. This is going to be good. They're going to get some guns. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, so Al's just mercilessly taking the mickey out of poor old Marcy. But then uh, the doorbell rings. Marcy just jumps up in shock. Um, and she yells, oh, God, it's my husband. Don't tell him I'm here. Um, and Al just calls out, come on in. She's here. Yep. Um, as the live audience, you know, they hoot and holler and whistle as is traditional for the the sitcom audience of married with children so in comes this tall slim good looking dude and um he says look i saw a woman come over here into this house and he asks them is one of you my wife (laughs) and so we see jefferson uh as we come to find out this guy's name is and he's looking at the ladies and so the camera is hovering over the ladies one by one camera on peggy camera on marcy and then camera on kelly and when Jefferson sees Kelly, he just goes, all right, and grabs yeah. her by the hand and says, come on, sweetheart, we're going back to bed. Yep. And at this point, because Kelly would just naturally go off with him and go, oh, okay, this seems yeah, she normal. Doesn't, she doesn't raise any objections or any queries or anything. No. So Peg jumps up and says, no, no, you've made a mistake. I'm your wife. <laughs> Al doesn't nice care. One, Peg. And Marcy has to set the record straight and say that it's her. Ah, anyway, they all think Marcy's won the lottery with this guy. And so they go through all the awkward stuff of introducing themselves. And we find out, hilariously, that Jefferson's last name is Marcy. Mm. Uh, Darcy, sorry. (laughs) Close enough. So she'll be, or she is now, Marcy Darcy. (laughs) Marcy Darcy. So Al, meanwhile, is telling Jefferson to run and get away from the Marcy situation as soon as he can. But Jefferson thinks that Marcy's cute. Um. Anyhow, since neither Marcy or Jefferson can remember the wedding, and Marcy's a bit upset about this, she didn't get to have a wedding, they decide to have the best wedding they can afford. Mm. I think we should have a little clip here, Steve. You you know what I was just thinking? The hangovers do come true. (laughs) (laughs) No, actually, I was thinking, if you want to have a wedding to remember, let's have one. Let's have the grandest wedding we can afford. Yes, let's. I have $2,000 saved. Okay, and uh, let's see, that brings us to a total of uh, 2040 <laughs> We can book a hall. Oh, no, you can't book a hall. I won't hear of that. How impersonal. You'll have your wedding in God's Cathedral, our backyard. Your backyard is Buck's toilet. <laughs> no, your backyard is Buck's toilet. <laughs> now, what do you say? I don't know. You think we can trust them? Of course. They look... (laughs) perfectly trustworthy to me. And besides, it's a closer trip to the honeymoon suite. Come on, let's pace it off now. (laughs) Oh, God's backyard. What you couldn't hear there uh, is that at the mention of all this money, Peggy and Al just look at each other and they hear the magical phrase, $2,000. And immediately in this sort of unspoken moment, they realize they have to come up with some sort of scheme to get their hands on the cash. Mm. So as you heard, they volunteer to handle all the wedding arrangements because that's what friends do, right? Oh, well, absolutely. Yeah. But each of them has this little fantasy scene in their head of what they're going to do with the cash. And for Peggy, it's like, you know, you can hear the Hawaiian music and... The waves lapping at the, the yep. beach. 
and a muscly dude offering to oil her down. And Al's, uh, he wants to use the cash to pay off his retirement property that he's always dreaming of. So we cut forward to Al at home doing some wedding planning for the food. And he's on the phone to some <laughs> dodgy butcher asking, you know, what's your cheapest meat, bro? Um, and so he, Al thinks 12 cents a pound. Or in our present money, Steve-O, because it's an opportunity mm-hmm. to play. Oh, no, we're doing this again, are we? <laughs> oh, yeah, we're going to end up at this. <laughs> yeah. So it's about 50 cents a kilo. Ooh. <laughs> so that's a bit pricey, Steve. 50 cents a kilo. And he asked the dude to throw in some beaks and claws for free. <laughs> Can you throw Ooh. in some beaks and claws? I love it. Yeah. Deal. Yes, more beakage. Um, anyway, just as Al <laughs> completes the deal... Jefferson comes in to ask Al to cover for him while he visits his parole officer. Now, this is the clip we heard earlier. Mm. Um, Jefferson's reluctant to admit this to Al, but Al reassures him that he'll be the soul of discretion and keep it to himself. Sure. And uh, Jefferson leaves, and as soon as that happens, Al shouts out to Peg to let her know all about it. Now, Steve, Al does technically keep his promise of not telling Peggy in a roundabout way, but how does Al let her know about the situation without technically telling her? They play a little game of charades. Charades! Yeah. Yeah. Now, this, this scene is the greatest scene of all televisual all comedy history. Um, do you want to describe a little bit about what happens here? Well, I couldn't tell if he, if Al doesn't know how charades works or whether Peggy's so bad at charades that she needs a little bit of extra help because he's basically saying all the words as he's miming them <laughs> yeah, it, 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 in order for her to, to get the picture. It's a very visual thing, but uh, mm. yeah, like you've you've nailed it. So what Al's doing is, you know, he'll tap his arm with two fingers to indicate two words or whatever. But he's also saying two words, <laughs> yeah. And then like he's using his fingers to stretch out the words to imply more syllables, and he's saying sounds like and tugging his earlobe. Yeah. <laughs> but he's explaining <laughs> well as he does it. Yeah, ah, it's very funny. Sounds like his risen. <laughs> anyway. Trust me, She's it's, terrible. A, it's a brilliant scene. Um, anyway, so now that Peg knows all about Jefferson's recent prison situation, Al tells Peg not to tell Marcy, or then the wedding's going to get cancelled, and then Al won't get to pay off his retirement property, to which Peggy says, don't you mean our trip to Hawaii? And mm. he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I meant. Totally. Oh. So we cut forward in time to the day of the wedding, and we're in the Bundy backyard, God's Cathedral, um, <laughs> which, to be fair, it... It does actually look pretty nice on this occasion, so they must yeah, have yeah, yeah. You know, got the whippersnipper out or something like that. So all the guests are either models in mini dresses or soccer players in their soccer uniforms and a whole bunch of scruffy-looking bikers in jeans and leather jackets. Uh, in the background, we can see Jefferson and Marcy, and they're just looking very confused. And we see Al emerge from this crowd with some sort of, you know, the sales tray slung around his neck. Yep. Like a vendor, and he's saying, "Get your wedding rice here, get your rice, get your red hearts." And he's selling these items in crappy paper bags and foil packages, and he's Absolutely. just trying to screw every last cent out of everyone he can. Oh, Do we he... get an explanation for why the bikers are there? I think perhaps they're they're some of the prison mates of Jefferson. You see, uh, so they're the groom's guests. Right. Is my my theory? That makes sense. Yeah. Peg pulls Al aside, and, and like she's already got her flowery Hawaii stuff on, right? So she's yeah. ready to fly out oh, as soon as the this bags thing is are packed. Over. She asks Al why the hell Bud's soccer team is there, and why Kelly's model friends are there. And poor old Al, he's so he just says, "Oh, you know, the damn kids! They've blackmailed me, Peg." And they've blackmailed him, and they're going to tell Marcy unless Al lets them have this wedding as their party. Mm. Which brings us back to the opening scene. But Bud does have a very important role. He does. Oh, man. So that's that must have been part of the negotiation, right? I think so. I don't think Kelly's bringing anything to the table. <laughs> no. good Um, Just let her do her thing and hopefully not mess things up too much. But Peg, right, she's just worried that all these extra guests are going to eat into their profit margin. But Al reassures Peg, oh, don't worry, babe, I've taken care of this by eliminating a few of the guests. And this is where Marcy interrupts, asking if they've seen her mother. Yeah. <laughs> And, and poor Marcy. Uh, I think we need a clip to explain about Marcy's guest. You don't think this is going to cut into our profit, do you? Uh, that's why I eliminated some of Marcy's guests. Where's my mother? <laughs> she won't be here, and you should hear this from a friend. She doesn't love you anymore. <laughs> Get your red hearts here! Well, and where's Aunt Mary? Mary, Mary, Mary. Oh, she gets snowed in. 
She lives in Phoenix. Oh, yeah, oh, that was Ida got snowed in. No, Mary's the one who, uh, who died. Get your wedding pretzels! Did he contact any of the, any of Marcy's family? I don't think so. No? No, I don't think he contacted them at all. No, I guess not. Holy moly. So with Marcy getting very suspicious at this point, and if not suspicious, then certainly very annoyed, um, Alan Pegg decided to distract her by getting the ceremony underway. And so we see Al go over and crouch down near some sort of amplifier speaker setup, mm. which we find out is a shortwave radio, and he starts hailing a guy named Captain Hank. Al tells Peg that he's saved a whole bunch of money by avoiding all those useless land-loving reverends who want money to do a wedding. Yep. So he's gone with Captain Hank, who will do the ceremony for a copy of Playboy and some cheap booze. So as everyone gets into place, Marcy asks where Reverend Appleby is, who's obviously her chosen family yep, yep, yep. dude. And Al tells her that he couldn't come because he's got an exorcism in Akron. <laughs> um, and Buck the dog is the bridesmaid instead of Marcy's sister. And so Marcy's really losing it. That is hilarious. It is hilarious. Um, This hat. (laughs) Oh, yes, yes. How how do you describe those hats? The kind of hat they would have been tap dancing in. In the 20s. Back in the days, except it's got flowers and things like that on it. But Buck does look very cute in the hat. He carries it well. Yeah. Uh, Having watched this episode several times, I noticed uh, that during that shot of Buck for a couple of seconds, there's these two big drips of drool that come down from, Mm. from Buck's hairy gob. Anyhow, the ceremony, it takes place and it's disastrous. And uh, I'll, rather than spend a few paragraphs explaining it, we've got another clip. Nice. <laughs> Retirement property one, to garbage scow, Toxica, come in. <laughs> Toxica here, Al. We're heading into a squall. Let's kick this wedding into gear. Huh? All right, everybody, take your places. Places, everybody. You two, approach... The speaker. Cam <laughs> Hank, you still there? Yeah, but we're taking on water here. Have a couple join hands. They're already joined, Hank. You take this woman to be your wife? I, I do. I can't hear you. You did, Hank. <laughs> now the broad. You take I would now like to read a poem I wrote to my love. Jefferson, my sudden love, my love so true, my shining... Can't hear you, huh? I do! I know how to pronounce you. Yeah, we just hit a speedboat. Look, you're now husband and wife. Full of stir, let's get out of here. <laughs> Al, very dignified, gets up and goes, You may kiss the bride. <laughs> yes. And she's really going off on him. Yeah, but he, he does get himself out of it, doesn't he, Stan? Do you remember how he gets himself out of it? No. All right, so Al knew this could happen, obviously, um, knowing his luck. So he pulls the ace from his sleeve and he says he's got a wedding present for Marcy uh, to make her feel better, Steve. Oh, so he leans forward very cunning. and he softly says, your husband was in prison. And he gives her a little kiss on the cheek and he walks off. And she's so side-swiped by this. Yep. Al's instantly out of trouble. So Marcy turns around and she starts interrogating Jefferson. But, you know, the, the director gives us a quick cut over to Al. And I was gathering Peggy and the kids, mm. and they're all gathering around. He says, right, we better get to the airport. And he says, kids, turn on the sprinklers. Yep. Wedding is over. And the scene ends. Now, presumably at the broadcast, this is where an ad break was. Yes. But we missed the bit where Bud is the, the, wedding, the wedding artist. Yes, he, he was cut for time. That's in my favourite gags. But yeah, oh, tell us what right. goes no, on no. here. No, no, no. Let's park that one and come back to it. No, no, it's okay. Let's do it now, I feel, while we're in context. Well, he's, so he's essentially Marcy's, drawn, yeah, drawn Marcy's a couple of Marcy's going figures. off her nut, right? Yeah. And saying, Al, you've cut out all these people and the Reverend's not here. And she says, where's the photographer? Al goes, I did, I did better than that. I've got a wedding artist. Nice one. <laughs> Bud. And he saunters over and shows this, this pad, drawing pad, and it's got two stick figures holding hands. And he says, what is it, copies will take two weeks or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Sorry, I'm just, my, my sides are hurting from laughing so much. Um, where on earth are we? Right. So we've come Sprinkles back from have the, come on. Yeah, the, and we went to commercial break and we've come back from the break. And the setting is in the Bundy living room. And Al and Bud are sitting on the couch together. And like very close, like Bud's right up against mm. him. And, you know, they're having a good father and son sort of sit on the couch. And Al's got the um like the brochure from the land development that his retirement block is on and and he's showing it very proudly to bud 
and saying, oh, look, this is Lake Chikamakamako. And, you know, we learned that through their little chat that Al had ditched Peggy at the airport, double-crossed her, and he went straight off to pay off his retirement block with the near $2,000 he swindled from Marcy and Jefferson. So just clarify this for me because I was a bit confused. Okay. Was the plan that they were going to split this $2,040 half-half? Mm. Mm-hmm. And no. they were going to... No? No, no. no, well, no. Okay, what? Oh, I'll, I was going to let you finish the question, but yes. So why should Al go halves mm. when he can lie to Peg and take all the money? So he's just going, yeah, babe, we're going to Hawaii. Yeah, yeah, your plan is a fully rocking plan. Yep. We're going to follow that plan. We're going to the airport. And uh, meanwhile, but Al's the one looking after the money. So as soon as he gets to the airport, and uh, like he just leaves Peg there. But as he says to Bud Dory, she's got her accordion. <laughs> yeah, so she can make a, enough money to get home. I thought he was saying she had gone to Hawaii and she'd be having to make her way home from there. Yeah. Using Look, funds from the accordion. But That's a possibility. <clears throat> So maybe they did go halvesies, but then why would he need to ditch her at the airport? Just because he didn't yeah. want to spend time with her. I think your explanation makes more sense. Oh, so. okay. Well, either's possible, mm. I reckon. We're nearly at the end here. So Jefferson lets himself in the front door and he's interrupting this nice family moment with Alan Budd. And Jefferson doesn't look very happy and he sarcastically thanks Al for snitching on him to Marcy. Mm. But, you know, Jefferson does concede that it's probably best to start the marriage off on a nice, you know, clear the air, honest starting foundation to build the relationship off. And at this point, we hear Marcy shouting out from next door. And she goes, Jefferson, Darcy, get your lying in made ass over here right now. Yeah, it started. So, um, Jefferson ignores this and Bud sort of asks Jefferson what he was convicted for. Um, and Jefferson says, oh, it's this just this land scam. I was selling off lots around this toxic waste pond called Lake Chickamacomico. <laughs> it was about five years ago. Oh, I went to prison and, and even though it was on the news, and it was this big scandal. He said, oh, some really stupid people are still sending in payments. Now, has he clocked the brochure that Al's got in his hand at this point? Do you think he's realised that Al has just basically paid him oh. another two grand? <laughs> and he's rubbing it in. Possible. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jefferson imparts this information and takes his leave. And so we're kind of left with Alan Budd. And they're both not knowing what to say to one another. And I swear 30 seconds goes by where they're sitting in silence. And Al just says to Bud, well, it beats being in Hawaii with your mother. Yeah. And then... <laughs> you one way of looking at it. Yeah. And um, then, you know, that's the end of the episode, but there's this little crushed dream of Al's in his little retirement property fantasy where it's sort of black and white and he's him and Bud are going fishing around this lake, except now that he knows it's a, a toxic waste dump, yep. and there's old car batteries and trolleys in this lake. And there's horrible acidic steam rising off it, and Al's got a tail, and his arm falls off. And <laughs> <laughs> they both got tails. Yeah. As Jefferson said, it won't be inhabitable to the year five million. Yep. And so Al's retirement property vision in his mind has somewhat changed. Anyway, that's the the end of the episode. Right, Steve. What what are your thoughts on? Uh, you know, what did you get out of this episode? <clears throat> Well, I watched it twice, and I realised on the second time that it's actually pretty well written, I would say. I like the way in the first scene you've got the kids, and I think I completely blocked this out the first time I watched it. Right. But I realised the second time that they're each asking for their own party, which they then get midway through the episode at the wedding. Yeah. Although I question Bud, wouldn't he be arguing for Kelly's party mm -hmm. with the models? Yeah. He wouldn't Instead be arguing a, against it. He wouldn't. Well, he definitely wouldn't be arguing against it. But you think he'd be he'd be dropping his own yeah his own plan and going with hers. Yeah. Oh well, we we can park that one. But perhaps you know he also wants it for his soccer friends so that he can impress his buddies Could by be. having them around to the house, which just happens to be packed with lovely models. Yeah. Cool. Two bird, two birds with one stone. Yeah. But I like yeah the way they paid that off. That was that was pretty good. I like the way um, this is another like plotting kind of thing when Al finds out that Jefferson's been to to Priz for swindling people part way through the episode he raises no moral outrage about the situation no. at all no but then of course he becomes the victim of the very scam that he's <laughs> Jefferson's Doesn't telling him about yeah later on and then this is the beautiful thing Jefferson makes like Al Al swindles the two thousand dollars <gasps> out of Marcy yes. and Jefferson, but then Jefferson makes it back. 
Yeah, well, that's possible. From Al. Yeah. I'd love the poetic justice of that. I have got one slight worry, though, in that whatever, wherever the payments are being sent to, uh, I'm sure when the FBI shut that down and Chuck Jefferson in prison, they would have probably confiscated that account or something along those no, lines. because that's one of the things he says to he Al says, is, people some still fools s- see, still keep sending me money. Yeah, okay. Well, so I'm thinking he's checked his, he said his secret account payments, balance. But, and... Oh, okay. Hmm. But either way, that's beautiful. I hadn't thought of that. He got his money back. It was genius. In fact, no, he didn't get his money back, dude. He got Marcy's money. Because <laughs> well, Jefferson think he... had 40 okay. bucks. Do you think he's going to give it to Marcy? <laughs> Hell no. No, this is why I'm saying it's such a great ending. Oh, man, that's cool. You've just enriched an episode I already admire so much. Good. Well, yeah. They were the main plot things. Yep. Apart from that, I've just got a lot of gags. Oh, cool. All right, can I chuck my observations in and then we'll both get yeah. to lists of gags? Sure. Cool. So uh, I do like how Jefferson went to prison for the real estate scam, which is perfect for Ted McGinley's background in college with urban planning, and he was mm. going to be a commercial real estate developer ah. before he got into the acting game. Yeah. Anyway, another connection here, Steve, is that when Al's fantasizing about his idyllic rural retirement property and mm. it all goes black and white and Al's down the lake with his fishing pole, do you notice that whistling song? <laughs> That, I looked it up, and that's from a show called The Andy Griffith Show. Mm. So it's this, you know, Owl's childhood. It would have been on during Owl's childhood. Would have been black and white. The perfect American dream of this is how he'd want to live in this small town in Mm. in his retirement. And uh, the little kid on The Andy Griffith Show is a character called Opie, who was a famous kid role back in the day. And Opie was played by Ron Howard. Whoa. Richie Cunningham. It's another weird coincidence. It's a massively weird coincidence. Or is it a coincidence? I don't know. So Ted McGinley replaced Richie Cunningham or, you know, Ron Howard on Happy Days. And uh, then we've got Opie coming up in the episode where he starts in Married with Children. Anyway. Yeah. We wandered wandered slightly there. Yeah. Um, All right. Let's get into gags. What have you got, Steve? All right. Well, they're in chronological order. We've got Alan Pegg playing a little game, and I think it's a game or it's a quiz or something like that out of this magazine that Pegg is reading as they're sitting together on the couch. (laughs) And she says, right, you have to close your eyes for this one. And the question is, what is my my hair colour? Now, Pegg has got the most enormous hairdo. Yes. It's like... (laughs) It's about three feet high. It's a huge red. red. uh, But, ow... He struggles to answer the question. <laughs> and he has to open his That's eyes hilarious. and look sideways without mm. alerting Peggy that he's actually looking at her hair. Yeah, well, that was funny. Yep. And when Al is saying to Jefferson that he's got to run from this situation, he says, run silent, run deep, yeah. which is the title of a submarine movie yeah. and an Iron Maiden song. Uh. And then he says, he follows those up with, run like Mexican water through a first-time tourist. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you've got to watch Jefferson's face. Yeah. When he's saying this, he's he's losing it. Uh, yeah, the reaction shots. Um, I like the fact that um, Jesse, uh, Marcy is getting her Mr. Darcy, but he's not quite the Mr. Darcy from Pride and Prejudice, is he? <gasps> I hadn't thought of that either. Hmm. Ah, Steve. Marcy Darcy we've talked about. Yep. Um, it's another, another one of the great things about Married with Children is even though... Al and Peg have this very um, this relationship where they're constantly biting at oh, each other yeah. and all this sort of stuff. They have these moments when they're so on the same page and it's just glorious. <laughs> so we see a couple of those in this episode where they both have the exact same thought about taking this money mm-hmm. from Marcy from the wedding. And then when they play their game of charades, they're totally in the moment together. Oh, completely. It's fantastic. Um, we've talked about the <laughs> Al asking the the meat supplier, if he can throw in some beaks and claws. Yeah. <laughs> and then oh. the second beak gag where he asks, he's just found out that Jefferson went to prison and he says, um, like, if there's only a bucket of beaks at the wedding, you'll go crazy and start slashing. 
Was uh, that the kind of thing yeah, you were violent, put in prison violent for? Violent crime, was yes. it? Was it? Yes. Now, the thought that $2,040 is going to pay off Al's retirement property is just hilarious to me. Now, <laughs> I know I'm risking you going into dialogue about what the equivalent of $2,040 is. A quick is. round of what's it worth now? Yeah. Yeah. But still, I the implication's the, the got to be that mm. you could barely buy anything of value property-wise for $2,040 even no. back in the day. Oh, but I, you know, I don't want to uh, be contradictory, mm. but I was under the impression that Al had been paying this off for quite some time. Oh. And that's why it's his regular fantasy, This right? was the final instalment, is it? So he's probably been paying it off for five years, and now he can see he's got enough for a final instalment, but on Al's meagre salary, it would have taken him another five years to pay off the last couple of grand yep. um so you think it's I, not I so thought al had been paying it off for yonks you know because uh, peggy recognizes when al slips into his fantasy world mm. where he can't be reached <sighs> and so i thought he'd been making payments for. Ages. i didn't get that i'm gonna have to watch it a third time okay excellent well, what a punishment <laughs> there's um in the backyard after the wedding or might have been before the wedding mm. i think he's telling her how he had to bribe the kids with the party yeah. Or something like that. They're just saying, where does this lack of ethics come from in the kids of these days? And they say, oh, it comes from, must come from TV. Yeah, I blame Which TV myself. It's a hilarious breaking the, is it the breaking the fourth wall? Absolutely. Joke because Married with Children was completely slammed for being a, a slimy show that no kid should watch. Absolutely. Ah, oh, man. Yes. Yeah. You're killing it. Captain Hank officiating the wedding via CB radio was hilarious. <laughs> Uh, With Buck as the bridesmaid, Peg doing the music and Bud as the artist. Yeah. Al, just, Al, Al says, bring on the orchestra. And Peg comes out with yeah. her accordion, playing it quite badly. Who knows what she's playing. Yeah. Uh, Al's description of his retirement property, it's right across the highway from a view of the lake. Yeah. <laughs> what? I hadn't thought of that, but yes, well well done. Oh. Um, this really rewards re-watching. I might have to watch it again as well. Yeah. And then the last one, I don't know if you remember the episode of the podcast we did where I selected an episode of Get a Life. Yes. Yes. And this episode was called With Chris. Chris's brain starts working. And Chris's brain starts working because the neighborhood's been flooded with toxic waste. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> and there's this whole montage of these crazy offbeat things happening. And Chris's ear falls off in one. And they've got this turkey that's kind of expanding and contracting like it's alive and all this the dog has just become a skeleton yeah and it totally reminded me of the bit where al and bud are wandering down to the to do some fishing by the lake and they've got tails and al's arm falls off yeah because and it's they've filled only up got... with the lake's filled up with toxic waste <laughs> and they've only got patchy hair there's bits of chunks of hair falling out and i think didn't we remark at the time that um they seemed to very get a much... life chris yeah and uh, they would have both been in the <laughs> early years of the fox network Yep, they seem cut from the same cloth yeah. in some ways. And that's the, uh, that's the end of my list. Wow, it's a cracking list. You've Thank brought you. up several things I hadn't come across or thought about. Um, what have you got? Oh, mate. Um, I've got, you know, during the wedding, I love the escalation of the bad news to Marcy, right? And it's over a period of minutes and it's just blow after blow after blow. And so first it's, you know, your mum doesn't love you anymore. And then it's your sister can't make it. She died. Yep. One of them got snowed in. And then there's another sister who is supposed to be the bridesmaid. And Al says, at least Buck cared enough to be here, unlike your sister. Yeah. And then the reverend's not there. And then her photographer's not there. And it's just... This is the wedding that's supposed to ease the pain of her not being able to remember <laughs> the actual wedding. Yeah. And this is going to linger worse in her memory. The, no the, second, wedding. the second wedding is going to be worse in her memory than the first one was. Totally. Well, she can't remember the first one, but you know what I mean. I do know exactly. She's going to have to have a third wedding just to get over this one. Ah, oh, yeah, I think so. Captain Hank. Now, when he's when Al is hailing Captain Hank, as we heard, he goes retirement property one to garbage scow Toxica. <laughs> the Toxica. boat. Yeah, which is like a play on Battlestar Galactica, garbage scow Toxica. Oh. So it's a Battlestar Galactica reference. Nice. Um. And uh, lastly, when Jefferson comes over to very subtly rip Al a new one for dobbing him into Marcy, Al asks Jefferson, look, how did Marcy react to finding out you were, you're in prison? And Jefferson goes, oh, she's jabbing a fork into the eyes of the little groom figurine that was on top of our wedding, Twinkie. Yeah, that was nice. 
which is just so economical with the the you know you get the joke about the figurine yep. and then the wedding twinkie showing how cheap our was not even a proper wedding cake uh, the do you writer think, do you of think this they, episode, they really did get a twinkie or that seems extravagant for... i don't know maybe he stole it from jefferson and marcy's cupboard who <laughs> can tell been. right where was i i was about to make uh, an absolute ripper of a point but i can't remember what it was anyway well, you're oh, talking yes. about the economy of that single line of dialogue Yes, I was. I was just, um, I've forgotten the writer's name, but she's just masterful. This episode is, is brilliantly done. Ellen something. Well, I thought it was Ellen L. Fogel, mm-hmm. uh, which is a very familiar Married with Children name, but I always thought she was a director. But if it is indeed Ellen L. Fogel, then hats off, because this is just superbly written. Um, right, back to Ted McGinley, yes. who this is all supposed to revolve around. I think it's also testament to how good he was in Married with Children that most of the interviews I heard, you had the interviewer chatting to Ted McGinley, they mentioned Married with Children first mm. um, before mentioning Happy Days or Dynasty or Love Boat. And, and even Wikipedia has it in that order that he's best known for Married with Children. Um, and to me, even though oh, I really enjoyed early Married with Children, I just think his arrival put the show over the top and it became the best it could be. So he he had a difficult job. By all accounts, he had tremendous fun playing Jefferson, and, and mm. the whole cast had fun. But um, he played the role of Jefferson perfectly, right? Because he's got to be interesting and cool, but not pull focus off Al or Marcy, because yep. that's the main conflict. And uh, he's also got to sometimes be a clown and this dumbass sidekick for Al. But he's also got to be this whip-smart grifter. And so it takes skill to handle all these contradictions. And he gets the tone right every single time and just makes the show funny as hell. And and he's had plenty of his own standout moments, Jefferson has, uh, including being a CIA agent. Um, but before I put my final case, Steve, even though we don't put cases in the actor yes. specials, I just want to quickly talk about the patron saint of shark jumping. Now, have you come across <laughs> this? Because no. this comes back to... Well, your brilliantly made points earlier mm. are that he comes onto these shows and then they end. Oh, yes. He gets cast and then it's game over. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> he's been called the patron saint of shark jumping. Uh, as you said, he's the kiss of death. And, uh, you know, for example, after Ted McGinley joins Happy Days in the later seasons, it gets cancelled. And then presumably same for Love Boat and Dynasty. However, Steve. Yeah, after another <laughs> however many seasons. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't hold up. So empirically, it's the kiss of life. Yes, not it's the, the kiss, kiss of, of life. Well done. Yeah, empirically, this isn't true because the literal Happy Days shark jumping episode was a full three years before mm. Ted McGinley ever came on board. And with Dynasty, he was there for the middle three seasons out of nine. So he left the show years before it finished. Um, mm. So these these facts, when you look at them, don't support the label of the patron saint of shark jumping. But I think what's happened is. This label's been laid on him with quite good humour by his ex-castmates who started to know a pattern. Yeah. And then they're going, dude, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. And so this this comes up in interviews. And actually, Ted McGinley is real cool about it. And he, he's just, uh, he plays into the humour about the whole thing. Um, I think it's a way that his castmates can take the mickey out of him and the critics can have a bit of fun with him in this sort of fond kind of way. But I did want to just... Uh, Straighten that one out for yep. the listener, just in case they came across this in their own research. So why did I nominate Ted McGinley? Well, um, of course, it was thanks to Married with Children and Jefferson being such a cool character. But I'd always taken Ted McGinley for granted. You know, he was just there. I mean, he was funny and it was good and all, mm. but I've never bothered to look any further into that. And it's remarkable when you do, because obviously he got his start by being an athletic, good looking dude. Um And he was selected by Gary Marshall just because he fit a visual stereotype. But that's only going to keep you in the game for, what, a year, two years, if you're lucky? If you don't have any actual skill, if you don't have a genuine presence on screen, and if you don't work at getting better, you're not going to be around for very long. You've got to have the chops as well. Yeah. And, And he developed all of that in a really short period of time. So all the acting he did alongside all the greats of comedy and drama and everything... And, of course, the best thing about The Love Boat for Ted McGinley is that it's known for all these superstar actors and celebrities coming through. Every episode, Mm. it was a different... You know, you'll get Patrick McGowan or you'll get Marlon Brando or who the hell knows. And so he gets to presumably pick their brains about the acting caper and all this sort of stuff. 
that's the way I see it in my mind. And, you know, working with the Happy Days crew and, of course, coming on to Married with Children, he already knew his craft by then, I dare say. But you've got these great actors, you know, like Christina Applegate was a a straight actor before she came into the show. And, of course, Ed O'Neill is just one of the world's greatest actors. And uh, he would have picked up some stuff off them. But anyway, I think it's Ted McGinley's ability to learn from all of these people um, that's allowed him to carve out this amazingly long career, which is still rolling 40 years later. Hmm. Uh, He's done 380 plus sitcom episodes, not to mention a bunch of movies and dramas. So, uh, but I still think this dude flies under the radar, which is why I want to get the sitcom showdown actor spotlight and shine it on Ted McGinley and bung him straight into the Hall of Fame. Give him his due recognition. I think so. Yeah. Well done, Jeff. Ah, well, look, thank you for bearing with me through all of it. Oh, Mm. not a problem. That was fun. Thanks, dude. Have you got any last words? No, no. Just to thank the listeners for the YouTube comments that have come through. That's been really good. Oh, really? uh, Keep them coming. Excellent. Yeah. And we had a, an answer to, in our previous episode, the character of Jimmy wakes up from a reverie about <laughs> this holiday that he was on in uh, Malta. Yep. And he's talking about Red Rovers. And so um, yeah, one of our listeners piped in to say that uh, Red Rover was a type of bus back in the day in England. So There you go. That kind of makes some sense, given the context that he was dreaming about being on a bus ride. So. And he did say one of the lines was it had a very interesting ticketing system. So he's mm. obviously a bit of a bus spotter. Yes. Jimmy. Wow. Is there such a thing? I know there's train spotters. I reckon there must be. All right. What have we got coming up next time, Steve-O? I don't know. It's a normal episode, your choice. So you've got a sitcom episode to select. That sounds like fun. Oh, I will be. And uh, the listener will hear from us then. See you, everyone. Take care. We'll talk to you soon. Ta-ta. Join us next time on Sitcom Showdown when we'll be putting another five-star episode under the microscope. And in the meantime, you can contact us with feedback on Facebook, Twitter at Sitcom Showdown, or by email at sitcomshowdown at gmail.com. <laughs>